10 years ago, I had a very different career than my current one as a neuroscientist. My job was to try and break into banks and financial institutes and find flaws in their design that's going to help us prevent other villains from stealing their money. We did it in what was called a black box approach. We would go to our website and we would only do one thing. We would only inject different inputs into the site, get the outputs, see what happens, and try to infer the entire structure behind. We try to see how the website works just by controlling one thing, what we put in. So here's how it looks, pretty much. We would go there to uh, an arbitrary website, to the login page, let's say, and we would start typing usernames, one after the other. And we would look at one thing in particular, the outputs, the thing that the system tells us about things that don't work. What errors do we get? Because the errors tell you a lot about the way things work behind the scene. So here we just tried all kinds of usernames and we get the same error. Username doesn't exist. Okay, we try one more and one more and one more until at one point we get a different error. It says password incorrect. And now we know something else. Now we know that we arrived at at least one thing that the system recognizes, this username. So here we have one step further. So the information that the system gives us tells us something about what going, what's going on behind. And then you can try to find things that the person who created it, the designer, didn't think about. Maybe he or she didn't think that passwords could be very long. So instead of a short 10 letters thing, we're going to put one million character string and see if it crashes the system or it gives us different errors. Maybe they didn't think that some characters can go there. We'll try that. And eventually, the things that people didn't think about, the flaws, would be the way we would go about finding access into the system. Now, what's interesting about that is that this same method is what I use right now to study a different mechanism, our brain. As far as we can know, we are the only species that decided to look inside its own structure and understand how we operate. We as if a computer turned its own webcam into its structure, looked under the hood, and tried to see how its wiring and circuitry are going on. We're doing that in order to understand how we behave, how we operate, who we are. And what we found by looking inside is that in these three pounds of jello are tens of billions of neurons. And each neuron has your entire genome. It's an, your entire character is encapsulated in this little thing, and they speak to each other. There are hundreds of trillions of connections between them. In fact, if you take just a cubic centimeter of brain, you find more connections than the entire stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And this structure gives rise to everything you, your choices, desires, emotions, behavior. It's all encapsulated in this thing. And we know it because if you lose a little bit of the brain, you change entirely. Whereas if you lose a part of your pinky, you're still the same person, a little sad, but not the same person. <laughs> and I can show you a few examples of how people who lost something in their brain became totally different. For instance, this guy, Charles Whitman. In 1966, this innocent-looking guy goes to the University of Austin, Austin in Texas, climbs the tallest building, and pulls an AK-47 and starts spraying people downstairs. He kills 14, and then he waits for the emergency people to show up, and then he kills them. He waits for the ambulance, and he shoots, shoots them. And for a while, he just sits there, kills people, until eventually the police climbs up and shoots him. And then they go and try to investigate what led this person to do what he did. And of course, like a classical story, he was a great neighbor. He was a Boy Scout teacher. He was always helping his friends. He was discharged honorably from the Marines. A great guy. So they go to his apartment and they start looking through his stuff. And what they find is his diary. And it turns out in his diary, he documented everything that happened to him in the last months. And in the last 30 days, he says, I feel I'm changing, I'm not myself. Something is happening to me that makes me a different person. I'm afraid I'm going to do something bad. And he says, and if I do do something awful, I want an autopsy done on my brain. And even if the check for that autopsy, which they run on his brain, of course, and they actually find a tumor pressing on a part of the brain called the amygdala, which has to do with anger, fear, aggression. So maybe this had to do with this behavior. And here's a more recent story from three years ago in San Diego. A woman calls the police and says, my husband, who regularly had a normal sexual appetite, became a pedophile. I don't know what to do. We have a young daughter, and I'm afraid for her. So they arrest him, and they start going through motion of, 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 of putting him into jail. But it, while they go to the trial, he starts having severe headaches. So they send him to the surgeon. 
who looks at his brain and finds a massive tumor pressing on his prefrontal cortex. And they remove that. And as soon as he recovers from this surgery, he goes back to his normal sexual appetite. So instead of being in prison, he goes back home. But it doesn't end here. Because a year later, the woman calls again and says, it's happening again. He's again a pedophile. So they bring him back to the doctor. And they say that there's some residue. Some part of the tumor wasn't removed. And they take it out. And again, he goes back to his normal behavior. This is like a controlled experiment. You can see something there, and you behave one way. You take it out, you behave differently. Now, this is not just something that happens to other people. All of us experience that every day. Tonight, you're going to have a reception, and you're all going to pollute your brain with some molecule called ethanol. It's going to make you funnier, cuter. Everyone else is going to look nicer. <laughs> we all know how sometimes some little things that we inject into our brain makes us totally different. So we understand that there's differences in our character. But the question is, is there some similarity between us all that we can use to decode brain activity? I'm going to show you in a second one example. Because the scientists what we care about is finding some parts of the brain that behave the same across all people, maybe finding one person that behaves differently so we can see how they work, kind of like the website before, and seeing if we can infer from that our behavior. I'm going to show you now a picture. And this cartoon image is going to have a lot of little images. One of them is going to stand out. And I ask you to try to see how fast do you find the odd man out? How fast do you know that something is different there? Ready? Here it goes. Presumably, it took you fractions of a second. Your eyes just went straight to the face. You all saw right away that something is different there. It's because in the back of your head lies this little structure that recognizes faces fast. It's presumably something that helps us find friends and foes in the jungle or something. And we're all very good in finding faces. All of our brains did it very, very fast. In fact, just to control for that, I'm going to show you another one. And this time, try to see how fast it takes you to find the old man out in this one. Ready? A little longer. We don't have a mechanism for detecting churches and cows in our brain. <laughs> we all have those mechanisms. And what's special is that, about that is we can actually look at people that have damage in those structures, in this part of the brain that identifies faces, and see how they work. We can find a woman who had a, a, a damage to this part of the brain and see how she behaves and see how her brain looks. So here we took one woman like that, sat in a classroom, and we asked her to just draw what she sees. And this woman, who cannot see faces, draws everything but the face, haircuts and features of the body that she uses to identify people, she just doesn't see faces. And this allows us to be really sure that that part that we're looking at is the part of the brain that identifies faces. Once we know this part, we can do a lot. We can start decoding activities in the brain. We find part of the brain that has to do with faces. Whenever it's active, the person is seeing a face. We find a different part of the brain that identifies objects. Whenever it's active, the person is seeing an object. Animals are there. Places are there. Once we find those, we can start decoding the patterns the person is seeing. We can have a person sit in bed, watch movies, we just look at the brain and we see what parts get active. The part of the face, the part of the object, he's probably seeing an object in a face. And what we can do then is actually decode this person's thought just by looking at the visual part. Here is a work done by Jill Gallant at Berkeley University who did exactly that. First, he had people watch movies and looked at his brain while those movies were watched and tried to see what part of the brain become active for each and every movie. People, objects, and so on. And what he did next, he said, now forget about the images. I don't want to know what I'm showing. Let's bring a computer and have the computer look at the brain. And just from looking at those sites in the brain, let's have the computer tell us what the person is viewing. So now the computer is just looking at the brain alone, not knowing anything about the movies. And it tells you in a semantic word selection what it thinks the person is viewing right now. First, it says there's probably a fish there. Maybe it's a flower. Here it says, I think I see water and something that swims. Maybe it's a whale. Then it says a fish again. You see, it's doing pretty well in reading what the person is seeing just from looking at his brain activity. Now, this is pretty nice, but it's still very crude. It's still kind of looking at uh, general uh, clusters, fish, ocean. It's pretty, what we want to do is we want to be able to say, it's my mother, it's my father. We want to be able to tell exactly what the person is seeing in a very accurate way. But it turns out that for this, we have to look much deeper inside the brain. We can't use scanners that just measure oxygen in the brain, something outside. We have to look really deep inside. We have to do something that goes all the way to the level of the nerve cells in the brain and see how they speak. Because every nerve cell 
encodes some piece of information. And if we can know what the cells say, we can actually know what the person is seeing moment to moment in a very accurate and precise way. Now first, let me tell you that it's pretty hard to have people let you open their brain and put electrodes inside so you can see their behavior. But this is done often and very frequently with animals. People in labs look at the activities that mice, rats, monkeys have, and they infer from that what they're doing. And let's say you were able to put electrodes in someone's brain. Here is how it would look. What you're going to see is a cell like this one. And what you're going to hear are these bursts of activity. This is a brain cell speaking to its neighbors and telling them, I care about something in the world. Whenever you hear this burst of electric discharge, this cell is telling something about what it sees. So what we want to do as scientists is look at all of those cells one at a time, know what happened in the world, and try to correlate it. See what happened in the outside world, see what made the cell speak, and understand from that what this cell cares about. Well, what I said earlier is that we cannot put electrodes in people's brains. It turns out it's not always true. There are some people that would let you open their brain and put wires inside. These are people that suffer from disorders that require brain surgery. And for these disorders, the best solution is to open the brain, put electrodes inside, look around the area that you think the problem is, find the problem, remove the part of the brain that causes the problem, close everything, and let the patient walk away seizure-free, tumor-free, something better. But then there's something else we can do. We can go to the patient and say, you know, you're already here. Your brain is already open and you're awake and just waiting for the surgeons to remove the tumor, would you mind letting us scientists show you pictures, ask you questions, ask you about your feelings, and learn something about your behavior from looking inside your brain? And turns out the patients are very happy to do that. And they let us do that. And what we can then do is go one step further. We can actually see singular thoughts in a very accurate way. Here's an example of that. Here's a patient and a colleague of mine, Hagar Gelbat Zagiv, was sitting with and having her watch movies. What you're gonna see above are the movies that the patient was watching. What you're gonna hear is the sound of one brain cell in this woman's head as she watches those movies. Now this cell cares about something very particular. Try to see if you can figure out for yourself what this cell cares about. This is a cell in this woman's brain that became active every time she saw The Simpsons. <laughs> this, is, this is the memory of The Simpsons in her brain, but all of you share the same cell. You all have many of those cells that became active right now when you saw this movie. And what's special about those cells is that they fire not just when you see that, but every time you think about The Simpsons, like right now. Every time you hear, smell, sense, think of the Simpsons, even in your own brain alone with no input, this cell becomes active. In fact, we know that because we came back to the patient afterwards and asked her to just recount the clips she has seen. Just recall freely which one she's seen. What you're gonna see now is she starts saying one at a time the things she's seen, and as she remembers the Simpsons, the cell becomes active. Actually, it's even more interesting. It fires before. What we're gonna see is the cell getting active, and a second and a half later she says, oh, the Simpson. We're gonna see her memory in action before she knows about it. This is memory in action. But what's marvelous about this thing is that it's not simultaneous. When I speak to you right now, I feel and you feel that everything I say just comes out at the same time. I don't imagine that my brain actually processes things I am going to say before I said that. I just listen to myself as much as you do. It all seems to me like it's happening at the same time. Now we understand that there is something in the brain that happens far before we can actually access that. I'm gonna show you in a second something even more marvelous about this thing. But here's the first thing we can do if this is true. If we can now look at cells and find cells in the brain that encode memories and thoughts, we can actually do something pretty simple that's still remarkable. We can start decoding people's thoughts and showing them on the screen, which is exactly what I did. 
we took patients, and in the morning, we showed them a lot of images, and we found cells that fire when they see Michael Jackson, cells that fire when they see Marilyn Monroe, cells that fire when they see the Eiffel Tower, the Big Ben, Apple computer, a watch, all kinds of cells. And then we told them, now, close your eyes, and just imagine one of those things. Maybe imagine Marilyn Monroe. And as you do that, we're going to see the cell firing in your brain, and we're going to project on the screen in front of your eyes your thoughts. So he or she sit there, and we just show them a movie of, your, of, them, of their thoughts. This was a marvelous work that I was very proud of, but it also led to the biggest flaw in my scientific career. And it happened in the following way. The paper came out. I was ecstatic. The sum of my five years PhD is coming out. And then as it came out, I started getting calls from journalists and reporters asking about my work. And the first few asked me about the work, and I told them in, in, in a elaborate fashion about how it's done. And then the fifth guy who called me asked me, can you tell me what it's going to be in the future? Can you predict what we're going to be able to use that for? And I made the following mistake. I started making predictions. And I said something like, well, in the future, we could actually interpret people's intentions and, and, and maybe memories and even their dreams. And the day after, this is what happened. There was headlines all over the news saying, scientists can possibly record people's dreams. This was day one. On day two, scientists have been recording dreams. On day three, it was scientists recording dreams and they're keeping them in the database. On day four, <laughs> the CIA works with scientists at Caltech to record dreams. By day five, this was the number one news item, and I could not kill this story. The only thing that killed this story was the midterm election in the US and the fact that the Prince William proposed to his girlfriend in the UK. Otherwise, I would for 10 days be the headline of the news because it was so fascinating. We all wanted to record dreams, and here it is. Scientists do, do that. But in fact, after I made a vow to never ever make predictions about the future anymore, a year, two years after, I got a call from the same reporter and he said, Moan, I want you to comment on something. A group in Kyoto has started recording dreams. Can you comment on their work? It turns out a year ago, a group in Japan did the same thing that we did before, with a twist. They actually found in the morning part of the brain that fires when a person is seeing people, places, characters, landmarks, and then they asked the person to go to sleep. They told him, go to sleep. And as the person was sleeping, a computer was looking at his or her brain and trying to see what parts become active. And then when the computer said, I think they're dreaming right now of people, they woke the person up and said, hey, what do you dream of? The person said, a person. So they could actually start interpreting a person's dream. This happened a year ago. It looked pretty much like that. What you see is a, visual, is a visualization of the dream. And you see the computer kind of guessing of the things it knows, what it could be. And then at some point, now we're 20 minutes before the patient wakes up. At some point in time zero, the computer says, I'm confident that the person is seeing characters in his sleep. They wake him up. And he says, indeed, I was reading a book in my dream. This is almost my guess from three years ago coming to life. Well, if this is true, we can go even further. Not only can we record dreams, thoughts, we can actually look a little bit backwards and find things that you don't know about. Decode your free will, your choices before they happen. And this is exactly what a group at UCLA did a few years ago. I took a person and I told him, let's play a simple game. There's a clock in front of your eyes, the clock revolves, and every now and then we want you to stop the clock. Press a button and, and stop it. So the person stops the clock, and this is marked as time P, the press. And then they did something very weird. They told the person, OK, you stop the clock. How about taking that a little bit backwards and telling us when you felt the urge to stop it, the will, the desire? When did you feel that you want to stop the clock? And the person says, well, I guess a little bit before. Fine, do it again. The clock revolves. The person stops it whenever they want. And then they say, I felt I want to do that a little bit before. They do it again and again. And what they found are cells in the brain that fire not only before the button is pressed, but actually much before the person perceived their desire to stop the clock. Like that. And this made me think of the coolest experiment ever. What if you could play the brain against the person in the following way? We come to the patient and tell him, patient, there's a button in front of your eyes, and we want you to press the button whenever you want. That's all. There's a button there. Whenever you feel like it, press it. When you press the button, a light comes on, 
And this is us saving data from your brain. That's all. So when the bite, so you, you sit there, you press the button, a light comes on, it's on for a second, it turns off again, and then it, that's it, another trial begins. So whenever you want, press the button. That's all, pretty simple. Oh, one thing. When the light's already on, this is when you save data from your brain, don't touch the button when it's already on. No problem, doctor. And what do we do? We figure out quickly how their brain looks when they are about to press the button. And once we know, every time they are about to do that, we turn the lights on. <laughs> so they sit there, they want to press the button, the light's already on. There's a buzzer in the room. What did you do? I told you not to press the button when the light's on. I'm sorry, doctor, I didn't mean to. It cannot happen by itself. Never mind, just don't do it again. <laughs> the patient sits there, hands for the button, and as soon as it gets there, the light's already on. After a few tries, they get it. They start to understand that somehow we read their mind and they try to fight their own brain. And that's the incredible moment. They try to do it faster. They try to use different hands. But nothing's gonna work. I'm inside their own brain. There's no way for them to trick me. That's a remarkable moment to see how your brain works against you. This is a moment that made me understand that we actually think of ourselves as the center. We think we're the puppeteer of this thing. But maybe we're the puppet. Maybe the brain is the part that dominates everything, and we're just the agents who see that. Now, this could be looked at as a sad thing, but I actually think it's a beautiful thing. And I'm going to end with just exactly that. In 1610, Galileo Galilei looked at the orbits of uh, the moons of Jupiter, and he felt that maybe the Earth is not the center. And this was a very sad moment, a moment of disbownment, where he realized that you, we're not the center of the world. He was agitated, he was nervous, but the reality is that this made us discover the vast, the vast wonders of the world. We could, we could finally go outside and see that. Maybe the same thing is gonna happen by understanding that the brain is what governs us and we're just a bystander to it. I'm willing to make a prediction that this is gonna be the next revolution. Our understanding that the brain is controlling us and we're the puppet of it, at the same time accepting it and knowing that this is marvelous. Thank you.